everyone. You'll be glad to know this is my final paper of the... Because um, <laughs> I have clearly been talking way too much. Um, but today, obviously, I was wanting to talk about Adopt a Monument and give an overview of what um, the scheme has really achieved in the last 20 or so years. So it's quite different from some of the other um, uh, subjects that I've been talking about. Um, but Adopt a Monument, um, as I say, it's been running since 1991 up in Scotland. Um, it initially ran from 91 to 98 as a supportive scheme, but without a dedicated project officer. Um, the scheme was really popular, but it had to be wound up due to, wound up due to lack of funding at the time um, in around 1999. Um, but in 2005, the scheme was reviewed and analysed for what worked and what didn't work. And it found that some of the sort of pitfalls of the scheme or what was constricting people, community groups to get involved um, with the scheme were um, was funding. That was a main constraint to people successfully completing their projects. Um, it was um, the fact that groups themselves, um, they, they felt that... They were having to do work that perhaps local government or local councils should be doing. Um, they also felt that they needed more professional support to complete some aspects of their project. Um, and they also, some projects, again, the group felt they couldn't complete projects if one key individual from that community group um, was suddenly, you know, went off the project, had to leave the project for whatever reason. Um, Training and support was a huge, um, a huge factor as well. They really wanted more formalised training to help them complete their projects. Um, they also found that there was um, irregular contact between professional archaeologists and the community groups. So they really wanted to have more contact with perhaps one particular um, archaeologist that could support them with their project. Um, and they also, I mean, the skills of running some of these projects, they didn't have those skills in house, things like project management. Um, and they also, Scotland's a very large country um, and it's very remote in places and it can be challenging for people in the Highlands to get down to talk to professionals in the Central Belt. I mean, sort of Glasgow and Edinburgh and the place in between. So it's, um, it's that rurality that can really can be a big constraint for some projects. Um, so on the back of that, there was a relaunched uh, pilot project between 2007 and 2008, and that was delivered by Helen, um, and it was really successful. And she worked with about eight projects throughout Scotland, and it really proved that there was an appetite for the scheme, and it really proved what could happen if you had a dedicated project officer just working with the community groups delivering um, a doctor monument. So thanks to Helen's hard work, um, there was then the case for a much larger project, which is where myself and my colleagues Phil and Fiona come in. And we've been working on the scheme for four and a half years now. Um, and um, we're due to finish at the end um, of March of next year. So we will be going for about five and a half years. And we're currently working with about 62 community groups across Scotland. We had an original target of 55 groups, but due to a little bit of funding, um, we've managed to extend that number. Um, we've got probably about five to 10 projects that we did a lot of work on, but for whatever reason, weren't able to be completed, landowner permissions changed, or again, key um, project figures um, weren't able to continue the project. Um, and also on top of that, we have a further 40 groups on the waiting list. So there is such a huge appetite for the Adopt a Monument scheme in Scotland and I'm really, really proud. It's worth all the blood, sweat and tears when you see that sort of those levels of engagement. So our sort of main activities, um, I've got our old figures there, apologies. Um, we do a, such a wide range of um, activities, but we provide advice on you know, project planning, delivery, fundraising, networking. We help them get permissions like scheduled monument consent from Historic Environment Scotland. We help them get planning permissions, listed building consents. We help them get funding. We help them um, develop new audiences. Um, if they want to work with a local school, but they don't know how, we can help them develop activities to help them engage with those different audiences. No project is the same. They are all so vastly different. Um, seem to represent all sectors of societies, of society at times. Um, so, and the most important aspect about it is community-led. So we facilitate the group's ideas around their initial idea, their initial passion, which is often a monument. 
So they come to us and they say, this monument is too overgrown, it's in bad condition. And we're able to facilitate their project by supporting them to either clear vegetation, get permissions, get funding, things like that, put up interpretation. Um, so by kind of developing, by taking all the like lessons we've learned from the previous two schemes, um, I did want to sort of go over two of the older projects that Helen worked on. So you can sort of see um, that they, you know, the scheme does work essentially. And the first one was Bogathnu um, Stone Circle, and this is in Dundee. Um, mm -hmm. It's right in the middle of a council estate in Dundee, and it was having problems with being like bonfires, it was being burnt, graffitied on. Um, it was quite a negative, dark, dark space within a public path. Um, so a Dr Monument worked with um, two community groups in that area and the local council to sort of clean up um, the site. They erected um, a fence around the site but with a gate so they weren't restricting access but they were sort of highlighting it as a space that where you know bonfires probably shouldn't happen. Um, this was a really good idea. They painted, um, they did a wildflower meadow around the site, again, sort of highlighting it that it was a space to be enjoyed um, rather than a space to be, to hang out with, um, hang out in, in with antisocial behaviour. And um, and they also, in, um, they, I've got some child labour shops there, um, but they also, they got the local school out. So they got lots and lots of children out to help maintain the, um, the wild, um, flower meadow, um, the site. They, you know, they got them to plant the meadow, um, and generally try and use the site in lessons and outdoor learning. Um, and I returned to the site a couple of years ago. Well, I think it's just about two years ago. You can see how sunny Dundee is. Um, but, it, you know, what you can see is that the site is still maintained. Um, the council, at the end of the project, the project develops a sort of um, service agreement with the council. So the council do go in and hamstring the grass. Um, and the, the fence is still there. And it's still, there was a little bit of graffiti, but far less than what had been recorded um, 10 years previous or uh, sort of eight years previously. Um, so it can really show that these projects can work. There is life, there is sustainability in them if there's certain factors in place, which I'll come on to. And the second project I want to talk about is Poldy Wells. And this, again, was um, a series of wells within a woodland um, area in Aberdeenshire. And the group basically had identified that these wells were completely, they're like spa wells, basically, um, so the, the 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 wells completely covered in vegetation. So they cleared the vegetation. They helped do conservation work on the structures themselves, and they installed the um, access bridge. You can just see that coming down there to make sure that people walking through the main forest path were able to visit that site. So improved access, um, well provided access, and, and kept that improved. And again, this site is still maintained um, as part of the forest management. It's, um, it's still visited, as far as I know. Um, there's leaflets available on it in the local village just below the woodland walks. Um, so again, this is a project that, sort of eight to ten years on, is still a success. It's still being monitored and maintained um, for other people, for everyone to enjoy. Um, just want to give you a few little stats, I suppose, for our, um, for our scheme. As I say, we're ending next year, so we're going to have a lot of data and a lot of evaluation that hopefully we'll be able to um, chuck out and throw at you and see see what you will think about some of the work that we've done. But these are some of our sort of initial results. We've um, The first two years were delivered with two and a half um, staff members. We had three short-term placements. Um, and due to leader funding, we had projects in the Highlands and Argyll and Butte. Um, in that area, we worked with 266 people directly. Um, which again, if you think how rural some of these areas are, they're not too bad stats at all. But then there was a further 1,182 people that took part in the Dr. Monument activity. So they came along to perhaps open days, guided walks, excavations and things like that. And I think those are quite considerable numbers for, again, these rural areas that we're working in. Um, so some of our early projects that we've worked on have included Mulcair Township and Chambered Cairn. This site was really interesting because the site had previously worked with uh, the then Royal Commission, Scotland's rural past, and that team uh, worked with the group, um, in this case NOSAS, to record the site um, formally. 
But what the team then, the, the community group then wanted to do was um, promote access to the site and also stop um, livestock trampling on the site as well. So we helped them um, erect, um, well, we, we've provided funding for a temporary uh, perimeter fence um, so that when um, Morris, the amazing farmer, was having his pigs out, we could actually fence off the site so they wouldn't troddle, troddle over the archaeology. Um, the group has successfully managed the bracken out on site um, and they have, they, re- they have a vegetation management plan so they regularly go out and manage that vegetation. They've produced a leaflet um, promoting access to the site um, as a site to visit to learn about Neolithic Scotland um, and also um, later um, sort of uh, later medieval townships. Um, and they've also promoted it heavily through their website as a site to go and visit um, to experience its really lovely views. And again, I think what's really worked here is that we had a very experienced community group working on um, the project. So they had a great idea of what they perhaps needed to do um, to get the project to work. Um, They had taken part in professionally led training previously. And we were also aided by a landowner who was keen to get people onto his land to experience the archeology, span which at times can be quite rare. So, um, and Morris, the landowner as well, he still, I mean, his house overlooks it. So he still monitors the site on a daily basis. Um, and the group go up very regularly. Um, Swaddle Bay, uh, which was the project David worked on um, in the past, um, this was in collaboration with the Ardmerkin Transition Project, um, Ardmerkin and the Ardmerkin Estates. Um, and the idea was um, to create a sort of vegetation management plan for Cadendris, which is a chambered cairn that the Transitions Project had been working on. Um, The kind of the community as well, um, what kind of happened was the estate wanted interpretation on site um, and local community members also wanted interpretation and wanted to get actively involved with the archaeology. There was, um, with many of these sorts of projects, there was issues with capacity who could deliver that training and support to get local community members um, out on site during the excavation. Um, So what we were able to do was actually sort of fill a hole in that way in that we were able to help local communities basically create and formalise a community group. And we worked with them on this project, and then they went on to adopt two further monuments on that peninsula. So they're taking the skills that they've learned from this project and then applying them to another project and then taking them onto another project. Um, and they just got formally constituted uh, last Tuesday, no, last Wednesday, and we were there to attend that meeting. And it was a lovely thing to see, to see them to go from two or three individuals that wanted to get actively involved in archaeology to actually become a constituted group. They're applying for funding applications. They've added 120 new monuments to the historic environment record, um, Highland Historic Environment Record. They're a really success story for us when it shows what you can do when you go into remote areas that have that have little... Uh, professional supports, so it's really good. Um, I'm wobbling. Um, and <laughs> Ray Cairn, this is another interesting site. It's just outside Inverness. Um, it's uh, again, it's um, just off um, from a council estate, right uh, next to a council estate. Again, it was issues of antisocial behaviour, bonfires, um, graffiti. People didn't really understand that it was a historic monument. Um, it, it has a weird story in that it's actually reconstructed it was moved because it was on the site of the a9 you've all driven over the site if you've driven north past inverness um, and it was moved to this area for as, as an education uh tool um it hasn't it had hadn't happened at that stage so this adopt money project was to work with the local community council to again stall interpretation we did um small scale excavations over the reconstructed um elements inside the cairn which you can just see in that top um that's a whole other tag paper. Um, and, um, and we also helped them um, develop education activities so the schools could then come out um, this, you know, and use this monument for their outdoor learning purposes. Um, this, um, this was an example I wanted to highlight in that this scheme, we've also um, looked at look, doing delivering sort of stewardship projects in different ways. So we've we've deliberately tried to experiment and this is one that's really worked in that it was it's Torwood Broch um Matt Ritchie who is about here 
at the conference. I urge you all to speak to him. He's brilliant. Um, he, um, through the Forestry Commission Scotland, they funded a series of works looking at lowland brochs in the sort of Stirlingshire area. And this was one of the sites. And um, basically, um, over the course of uh, five days with 25 volunteers, we cleared quite a considerable area, this site of vegetation, um, so that it could then be laser scanned. So, um, and we went up again, we went up to see the site last week, um, two, de- two years after this whole scale vegetation clearance. And we do have a bit of work to do on the bracken, but for the most part, the monument's looking brilliant. It's looking really well managed, really, really great site to visit. Um, and I suppose my point about this one is that it's a, it was a great engagement project. 25 people came out and helped us do, um, deliver that, including my poor husband, who's actually there on duress on a Saturday. Um, but also a great data set, um, a really lovely baseline um, survey now, um, laser scan survey of that monument um, that will help inform conservation decisions at a later stage. Um, This is another example, which I have talked about elsewhere, so I might um, zoom on from it. Um, But again, this is an example of where we've worked on a scheduled monument by managing vegetation. Um, This is a canal lock. Um, It's a scheduled monument, managing vegetation, uh, recording it, enhancing the record and knowledge on that monument, while also working with young people who are out of work. So having these dual purposes coming out of these stewardship projects, I think, is something we want to develop more for the next phase. Um, we've also tried, um, as I say, building different communities. We've done a lot of work um, using online resources, um, social media. It sounds like old hats now, but five years ago, not everyone was doing it and people still felt quite uncomfortable about social media or digital engagement. So we've done a lot of work about that um, in the last five years. Um, and we've also tried to go out and look at uh, work with different and new communities um, in that way. So... My last few minutes, what are we doing next? Well, we are planning to do another phase of Adopt a Monument. That's what we really want to do. Um, And I think um, given our waiting list, there is a clear appetite and audience for it in Scotland. Um, In terms of stewardship, we found that it's clear that projects which work and which seem to be sustainable are ones that have a diverse group or diverse partnerships involved with them. So skills that... um, you know, so perhaps po- projects that have um, in-service agreements with councils or national bodies like Historic Environment Scotland or Forestry Commission Scotland that are able to incorporate these monuments into their management plans yeah. mean that these sites live beyond the lifespan of a group. And I mean that in quite literally, but also in terms of a group losing interest, which does happen. So I think that's quite interesting in some of those um, projects there. Um, <laughs> We also see what's really important is upskilling our community groups. In the case of the Arden Merkin group, the skills that we gave them on one project, they were then able to deliver on two other further projects. Again, we worked with them on those projects, but with each project they were learning and developing and taking those skills to new areas. And they are engaging with other monuments on the peninsula. They are taking those skills um, and um, going further with them. Um, And I suppose really as well, as I say, for us as a scheme... We are, as I say, hoping to have another scheme, um, but we've also started work with some of our European partners. Um, Adopt a Monument in Finland is going down a storm um, and has just won a Europa uh, Nostra um, prize, which we're really excited about. I'm really proud of them um, because we love them. They're amazing, even though I talk too much because I'm not Finnish, but I've been told. Um, So, um, And we're also working very closely with the Heritage Council, who are doing a pilot phase of Adopt a Monument Island. And again, that's really exciting, seeing the audiences um, over there, that, that there's clear need for them in those countries. And the fact that our sort of framework for projects seems to be working in different heritage frameworks. I think that's what's really interesting. And we have had inquiries from other countries, which we will be developing again over the next year. So that's a very, very brief run view. As I say, I can have a whole day talking about Adopt a Monument, but I had 20 minutes. (laughs) Thank you.